Hi, welcome to a little garden lecture here at Johanna Shores. My name is Randy Winkler. I'm the owner of Gateway Gardening. We maintain the property here at Johanna Shores, as well as some other Presbyterian homes. Over here against the wall, you'll see my crew. Starting on the left, that's Sam waving. There's Bunny. She's the most important member of the crew. Andy and his daughter, Sydney. Uh, we also have William who's not here today, but that's our crew. We maintain the property here at Johanna Shores. We also do Eagle Crest. We do Carondelet Village part of it. We do Maranatha. Uh, we also do Highland Chateau, which is not a Prez Homes, but it is another assisted living facility. But this is by far our largest and our favorite property. We shouldn't say that, but it is our favorite <laughs> property to work at. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the flowers that you see here on the table and some other stuff. Sometimes I'll have real flowers. Other times when it's a flower that's not in bloom, I'll have an artificial silk flower. I'll talk about the history and the symbolism and why these flowers are important. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to help with the habitat here for pollinators at Johanna Shores. Then we'll take a little stroll around the garden here and we'll go down by the chapel. So that's kind of the, uh, the program for today. So first of all, I'm going to talk about medieval paintings and medieval art. Most people in medieval times were illiterate. They could not read or write. So artists use images in pictures to tell a story. Oftentimes they used animals. For instance, if you wanted to show that a person was loyal, you put a dog in the picture. If you wanted to show that somebody was of royal blood, you put a deer in the picture because all the deer belonged to the king. They were his property. But they also used flowers. And I'm going to talk about flowers in particular in a garden called a Mary Garden, which is a garden devoted to the Virgin Mary. So a medieval housewife would get a statue of the Virgin Mary and she'd get a bench and she'd find a place in her yard where she'd set it and then she would surround herself with flowers associated with the Virgin Mary and then during the course of the day she'd go out there with her Bible or her book of devotions and she'd spend time away from the drudgery of her life as a medieval housewife. One of the first flowers that they used to symbolize the Virgin Mary was this. This is an iris. Uh, this was called a sword flower in medieval times because the leaf of the iris reminded people of the shape of a sword. Now Mary had been told by Simeon, and a, sword, and a sword shall pierce your heart, referring to the fact that her son would die on the crucifix, but that also seeing her son on the crucifix would be a symbolic sword through her heart. So Simeon had, had, Simeon had said to Mary, and a sword shall pierce your heart. And because this looks like a sword, they decided they would have the iris be a, a symbolic flower for the Virgin Mary. Well, later artists thought the iris was really not an appropriate flower. It's an exotic flower. It wasn't native to Europe. It's from the Far East. It was a very expensive flower. And they thought that was not really an appropriate flower to be used for the Virgin Mary. So they said, why don't we look for average, ordinary field flowers? And we'll use them to represent the Virgin Mary. The first flower they chose was a simple daisy. Because of its whiteness, it was a symbol of purity and virgin birth. So they chose a daisy. They also had Mary surrounded by a small gold flower like this. This flower in medieval times was known as Mary's gold and we have just shortened it to marigold. So this is a marigold. This is actually an African marigold because it's so large. But this name Mary's gold was shortened into our flower marigold. Some of the other flowers that they associated with the Virgin Mary was uh, when it was said that the Virgin Mary was uh, found out she was pregnant and she was going to visit her cousin Elizabeth, wherever she stepped, columbines sprang up and they're called Our Lady's Footsteps. When she was at the crucifixion, when her tears fell on the ground, lilies of the valley came up and they're called Our Lady's Tears. Another flower that is associated with the Virgin Mary is a lily. Uh, mainly because it said that the angel Gabriel, when he did the Annunciation and told Mary that she was going to have a baby, he uh, tra uh, traditionally, traditionally had a white lily in his hand. And last of all, we have roses. Mary is considered the queen of heaven, the rose is considered the queen of flowers, so you'd have also roses in this garden. So a medieval housewife would get a statue of the Virgin Mary and find a place in her yard where she would plant these flowers that all were symbolic of the Virgin Mary. And this is called a Mary garden. So a medieval housewife would find a place in her yard where she'd set a statue of the Virgin Mary, find a place to sit there, and then she would surround herself with all these flowers associated with the Virgin Mary. 
But flowers did not just have religious uh, symbolism, they had symbolism for other things. This is a hydrangea. Hydrangea means water vessel. Hydra, hydra like hydroelectric. Hydra means water. Hydrangea means water vessel. It just requires a lot of water to bloom. Hydrangeas are symbolic of a strong, powerful emotion. It can be either good or bad, but it's just a strong, powerful emotion. We have several types of hydrangeas on campus. This is an Annabelle hydrangea. We also have a form of hydrangea called Endless Summer, which if you affect the soil effectively, it will turn blue. While this campus is watered by a sprinkler system, I cannot control the pH across the campus. So we just let the, the uh, plant go as it is. So sometimes you'll see it as blue flowers, sometimes it has pink flowers, sometimes it have a, half a, a flower half pink and half blue. This is hydrangeas. This is nicotiana, nicotina, or tobacco plant. Uh, nicotiana, nicotina, or tobacco plant. And yes, it does have nicotine in it. It is related to the plant that forms uh, the, uh, the tobacco. So yes, this has uh, nicotine in it, but this is a smoke-free campus, so we don't want to see you out there chewing on my nicotina tobacco plants. That's nicotina. This is a daylily, and we've got many, many varieties of daylilies on campus here, and I'll show you later in the tour of uh, uh, patches of daylilies. This is sometimes called the three today, yesterday, tomorrow. This was yesterday's blossom, this is today's blossom, and this is tomorrow's blossom. So it's your past, your present, and your future. Past, yesterday's blossom, today's blossom, and the future blossom. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. It's called a daylily because the blossom just lasts one day. Over here now, this is Celosia, sometimes called fiery head. Uh, a relative of this plant is a very important food crop in Africa. It's very much like spinach. It can be eaten raw or it can be eaten cooked. Celosia, a very important food crop. In Uganda, the translation for the name of this plant into English is make husband fat and happy. Make husband fat and happy plant. Celosia, an important food crop in Africa. This is a geranium, and if you see in the pots here, over here we have some white geraniums. You'll see geraniums in these pots here. Another name for geranium is crane's bill, because after the blossom fades away, it has this, which is the seed pocket, packet, and it looks like the head of a crane with a little bill. So it's called a crane's bill, or geranium. Gerania is the Latin word for crane. So that's what it gets its name from. This is a dahlia. Here on campus, we have miniature dahlias, and we also have, uh, in a few weeks, we're going to have giant dahlias. Dahlias are named after Anders Dahl, who is a very famous Swedish botanist. So dahlias after Anders Dahl. They say the roots of the miniature ones like this aren't uh, able to be saved. We do save them and try and uh, put them uh, in the ground next year. Some of them come back, not all of them do, but these are our dahlias. This is a snapdragon. A snapdragon is a symbol of deceitfulness because if you open the jaw of the flower, it will snap back on you. It's like the little mouth snapping back on you. It's a symbol of deceitfulness. Snapdragon, snapping back on you. Snap. This is a zinnia. And although it's a beautiful flower, it has kind of a melancholy meaning. Zinnias mean you're missing somebody that you haven't seen for a while. Maybe it's a relative you haven't seen, an old friend, maybe it's a spouse that you haven't seen for a while. So even though it's such a pretty flower, it has kind of this sad, melancholy meaning. And the opposite of zinnia is here, the petunia. Petunias are the happiest flowers in the garden. They literally mean, we're so happy you are here. We're so happy you are here. So we plant lots of petunias around the gardens because we want everyone to know we're so happy you are here visiting our gardens. It makes us feel so good to see residents and staff and family members come walking around the gardens. It, it just really makes all of our work feel like we're really having a wonderful time. So uh, we're so happy you are here. This is an important flower to me because it's how I got the name of my company, Gateway Gardening. This is Joe Pieweed. It's an important flower for pollinators. It's not in bloom right now, it's in bud. But this particular version of Joe Pieweed is called Gateway. And that's how I got the name for my company, Gateway Gardening, named after this plant, Joe Pieweed. Here we have a plant called Russian Sage. Uh, I have allergies, which is probably not the best thing for a gardener who's working outside all the time, but this is a very pungent flower. The leaves very much smell like sage that you would have at Thanksgiving time. 
when we cut this down at the end of the season, we roll it up in bundles and I go into sneezing fits because it is so strong and I can barely take the smell of it. But this is Russian sage and again, very pungent flower. This is a tulip. Tulip. It gets its name from an Arabic word. Tulipa is the Arabic word for turban. So if you see when it's not in bud, it looks like a little Arabic turban. So tulipa is the Arabic word for tulip and that's where the tulip gets its name. Here we have a gladiola. The gladiola gets its name from the gladiators. If you look at this leaf, this leaf reminded people of the gladius. The gladius is the little kind of killing sword that the gladiator used to kill his opponent. And they said this reminded them of a gladius. And that's how the gladiator gets his name. The gladiator is somebody who uses the gladius. Because this reminded people of the gladius, they named this flower the gladiola. It's actually the flower of the gladiator. And whatever you think of gladiators, strength, power, determination, forcefulness, that's what the gladiola is significant about. Uh, over the winter, I had a lot of time sitting at home, and I spent a lot of time ordering flowers, and I kind of overdid it on gladiolas this year. So we have hundreds of gladiolas throughout the garden, and they'll be starting to bloom in the next couple of weeks. Here we have a peony. Peonies are symbolic. They're, they're a Chinese in origin. They're symbolic of happy marriage and a happy life. So we want to make people on campus here to have a happy marriage and a happy life. So we have peonies here on campus. Now, peonies have a problem with them. Uh, this is the leaf of a peony. This is a healthy leaf. It's nice and green. This leaf, you can see, has some powdery mildew on it. Powdery mildew is a fungus that actually gets in the soil. Uh, in order to get rid of powdery mildew, you have to dig up 18 inches of soil and completely replace it with new soil. Well, I'm not going to dig up 18 inches of soil all around campus here, so I just kind of learned to live with powdery mildew. Uh, one of the things that they're saying now is you can spray it with mouthwash and it will kill powdery mildew. So that's the next thing I'm going to attempt. This just reminds me that nobody's perfect, flowers are not perfect, there are going to be flaws in a garden, and so no, my peonies are not going to be perfect, there are flaws, but that's okay, you just accept them. This is a cherry blossom. Cherry blossoms are particularly significant in Japanese culture. This is the flower of the samurai, the flower of the samurai. Samurais were warriors who pledged allegiance to a lord. And as part of their pledging allegiance, they pledged to a code called Bushido. Bushido is the code. It's their code of conduct. It's the way they behave, the way they dress, the way they talk and everything. It really regulates everything they do in life. And if a samurai offends his liege lord somehow, makes him lose face, According to the code of Bushido, the liege lord could say, I want you to commit seppuku, or ritual suicide. It reminds samurai that life is fragile. Uh, cherry blossoms just last a very short amount of time. They're very fragile. So this reminds samurai of the fragile nature of life. In World War II, kamikaze pilots painted cherry blossoms on the sides of their planes before they flew them into allied warships. Again, they're a very important flower in Japanese culture. This is a phalaenopsis. It's a type of orchid. It means moth orchid, phalaenopsis, because the blossom looks like a moth. It's a symbol of luxury and elegance and refinement because they used to be so expensive. Nowadays you can see these at Target and Cub Foods and Home Depot and so on. This is the most common orchid. You can get them for like under $20. But their original nature is that they're extremely uh, expensive, they're, they're elegant, and they're refined. This flower is a calla lily. Calla lily. Calla means beautiful. Calligraphy. Calligraphy means beautiful writing. Calla lily means beautiful lily. It's supposedly the most beautiful flower in the garden. And it gets its origins in Greek mythology. There was a young man uh, named Alcides. He was a son of the god Zeus. Zeus was noted for having many, many extramarital affairs, many, many affairs outside of his marriage to Hera. And one of these was Alcides. Well, Alcides, Zeus wanted Alcides to be superhuman, so he drugged his wife Hera, and when he was, she was drugged, he had Alcides suckle at her breast so that he could get superhuman powers through her breast milk. 
example, Hera awoke from her drug state and she threw the infant off the mountainside. Her breast milk sprayed across the heavens where it became the Milky Way. That's where we get our term from the Milky Way. A couple of drops of her breast milk fell on the ground and up from the ground sprang the calla lilies. Because its origin is the breast milk of Hera, it has to be the most beautiful flower in the world. So calla lily, calla lily, beautiful lily. So I mentioned that a man named Alcides was the baby. Alcides was Hera's mortal enemy. She hated that kid forever and ever. And she did everything to make his life hell. So what Alcides was, he said, I'm going to get even with her. I'm going to change my name. I'm going to change my name to Heracles. You're probably more familiar with his Latin name. It's Her Hercules. But in, uh, in Greek, it's Heracles. And Heracles means the favorite of Hera, Hera's pride and joy, the best of Hera. So in order to get even with her, he changed his name, pretending that he was her favorite son when she actually hated him. Okay? Those are some of the symbols of flowers here. I'm going to talk now about the rest of the flowers here. One of the uh, things we do here on campus is try to promote uh, the pollinators here on campus. So these, these are f pollinator flowers. The first one I'm going to talk about here is Liatris. We have both the white and the purple variety here on campus. Liatris is unusual because it's one of the very few flowers that blossom from the top down. You can see it's starting to bloom here at the top and it works its way down. Most plants start blooming at the bottom and work their way up. Liatris start from the top and work their way down. We let Liatris go to seed. We don't let many plants go to seed, but we do let these go to seed because in the fall, it's an important food for, uh, for songbirds like sparrows and finches and wrens. So we let those go to seed. We also have here on campus milkweed, and we have three different varieties of milkweed. This is the common milkweed. It has kind of just a not, not very descript kind of off-white flower. This is swamp milkweed. It has a pinkish flower. And then here we have butterfly weed, which has an orange flower. So these are the three types of milkweed we have in campus. Milkweed, as you may know, is the uh, food source for monarch butterflies. The caterpillars eat the leaves of these milkweeds. So we have these many places on campus here in the gardens and down by the pond. Uh, Johanna Shores here is a member of something called Monarch Watch. Here's our certificate of appreciation. In order to be a member of Monarch Watch, you have to do three things. You have to give places for where they can nest. So we have places on campus and bushes and trees. We also can do little things like Monarch butterfly houses. You have to agree to plant milkweed on campus. And you also have to agree to plant fall pollinator or fall uh, nectar flowers. I'll be getting to those in a second. If you do that, you register your company or your plot of land and it becomes a part of Monarch Watch. And this says, Monarch Way Station provide milkweed, nectar plants, and shelter for monarchs throughout their annual cycle of reproduction and migration. In appreciation for their efforts on behalf of Monarch Watch, awards this certificate, Johanna Shores Presbyterian Homes. So we are a member of Monarch Watch uh, because we do those three things. I was talking about pollinator flowers. Here's one of them, Blue Vervain. Here's another one, cone flowers. And also we have zinnias that I showed earlier. Zinnias are also pollinator flowers. As well as this, this is a black-eyed or brown-eyed Susan. These are all plants that bloom late summer or fall and they provide nectar for the butterflies. So monarch butterflies winter over in Mexico. And a monarch butterfly flies all the way from Canada to Mexico. Flies about 50 miles every day. So it needs food all along that way from Canada all the way down to Mexico. And with habitat being destroyed and, and people deforestation and so on, there are le fewer and fewer areas where monarchs can get food. So part of monarch watch thing is that we want to have food sources for the monarch butterflies all the way from, Can from Canada down to Mexico. Now when they return in the spring, a monarch flies, lays its eggs somewhere along the way, that egg hatches, another monarch butterfly is further along, and there's a series of monarchs to get to Canada. But in the fall, that one monarch butterfly flies all the way from Canada all the way down to Mexico, a couple thousand miles, 50 miles a day. Other things we do here on campus is we support mason bees. This is a mason bee house. You can see it's got these little, tiny little bamboo things. Mason bees are a solitary bee. 
Uh, there are over 400 varieties of bees here in Minnesota. Uh, the honeybees that you know of, think of, make only about 10% of the bee population. The vast majority of bees are not honeybees. Mason bees, oops, upside down, mason bees are solitary bees, means they don't go back to a hive. Now, when a honeybee, it could get a disease, it flies back to the hive, it could infect the entire hive and the entire hive could die. If a mason bee gets infected, it's just one bee. It's not going to affect a hive, so it's not as bad if something does happen to it. But mason bees in early, early spring hatch. During the summer, here's a female mason bee. You'll see it lays an egg in one of these things, kind of like these holes here. It lays an egg in these holes, and it first of all lays eggs for uh, ones that are eventually going to be females. So the females are at the very back and then they'll cover it with mud. That's why they're called mason bees, like masonry cement work. Then they'll lay another egg, cover it with mud. And then the very last egg they lay at the very end of the tunnel is a one that's going to become a male bee. So in the spring when they hatch, at about 55 degrees they start to hatch, the first bees to hatch are the males and then they start looking for the female bees. For about two weeks, mason bees do what birds and bees do, and then after two weeks, all the males die. And the females are the only ones that are left, and for the rest of spring, summer, and fall, the female bees do all the work. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> so those are mason bees, and you, you'll see we have these mason bee houses on campus. Some residents have actually made some for us. Down by the chapel, I'll point one out where a resident has made a mason bee house for us. Last thing I'm gonna talk about, or one of the last things, I'm going to talk about here. Uh, we also trying to support the ladybug population here on campus. There are actually over 50 varieties of ladybugs here on campus and we're particularly looking for some that are endangered. So if we see a ladybug, I'm having my crew start to look for this species of ladybug. There's four uh, species of ladybug that are either endangered or have gone completely extinct. So this is one of the other things we're doing here on campus. Other things we do is we put up bird houses, we put up bird baths and so on. So we do a variety of things on campus. Here we have something I'm going to talk about as Solomon's seal. One of the things that plants did is that they had medicinal purposes. This plant is named after King Solomon of the Bible. Now there is true Solomon's seal and there's false Solomon's seal. True Solomon's seal has buds and flowers underneath and it has purple berries. False Solomon's seal has flowers at the tip and it has red berries. Well, if you have it in bloom or if you have it berries, you can tell if it's true Solomon's seal or false Solomon's seal. But if it doesn't, how can you tell which one it is? Well, King Solomon said that if you take the root, this is the root of a Solomon seal, if you cut it in half, inside the root will be a, a member of the Hebrew alphabet. And that is my seal of approval that this is Solomon's seal, it is the true stuff. We have a resident here on campus who is Jewish. She asked to see this last year and she said, yes, I see the symbol Bet in there. So yes, she did indeed see a symbol of the Hebrew alphabet in this root of the Solomon seal, signifying that it's true Solomon seal. Last thing I'm gonna talk about is our nasty, nasty little pest here. These are Japanese beetles. Uh, they just started peer appearing here on campus a couple of weeks ago. I was hoping we would not see them, but they did appear here on campus a couple of weeks ago. They're a nasty, nasty pest. Even though their name is Japanese, they're not f they didn't come here from Japan. They actually came here from Europe. They appeared in New Jersey around 1910, and slowly they've been moving westward and northward. They're not yet in northern Minnesota. The, the winters in northern Minnesota are too harsh, but with warming up in the climate and so on, who knows whether they'll soon move into northern Minnesota. So these are our nasty little pests. What they do is they go after leaves of plants. So if you see leaves like this, these have all been eaten by the Japanese beetle. Now, they tend to prefer certain types of plants and we know which plants they like. So when we get here in the morning, we go to those plants and we take them off them and we squish them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we know which plants they go after. So that's our little Japanese beetle, our little pest here. Okay, so that finishes this portion here at the table. We're gonna now go to some places around the uh, area nearby. I'm gonna point out some interesting features of some other plants. So we're in the garden right off the patio here at Johanna Shores. I'm gonna point out the two most asked about flowers here on Johanna Shores. This is a gazania. It's sometimes called the African daisy, and it comes in yellows, whites, purples, variegated, and so on. Uh, it, comes, it closes at night, and luckily we have a sunny day today because it opens when the sun is rising. You can see it comes in many, many varieties, variegated ones like this. So these are gazanias or African daisies. Now in the spring, 
in the greenhouse, they look just like this. And people say, well, what do I want that for? It doesn't look like anything. So I buy as many as I can, knowing what they're going to look like, because I know that eventually they turn into this beautiful flower. The other flower, which is not quite in bloom yet, is this. This is called the Lysianthus. In the next couple of days, this will be blooming. Lysianthus means locked or dropped jaw. And I think the reason it gets that is when it comes into bloom, you'll see it and you'll kind of go, oh because it is such a beautiful flower. It's also called the poor man's rose. It is oftentimes used in wedding bouquets because it looks very much like a rose in wedding bouquets. So this is Lysianthus and this is Gazania, the two most asked about flowers in the garden. We're gonna now move over a little bit here. I'm gonna show you one of the oldest flowers in the garden. It's also just about to bloom right here. This is called Datura. Datura, it actually has its origin in Egypt. In Egyptian times, the ancient pharaohs would have their doctors grow this plant. It has kind of like a bell-shaped flower. And then they would take the seeds from this flower and they would grind it up and then they would put it in a drink and it becomes an almost undetectable poison. So when the pharaoh wanted to poison his enemies, he would have his physicians grow the deadly datura. That's what it was called, the deadly datura. These have just seeded themselves. We didn't plant these. They just grew from seeds from last year. In fact, a lot of the flowers in this garden over here, seeded themselves. We didn't plant very many of these flowers, they just all seeded themselves. This is our bulb garden. During the course of the summer here, you're gonna see many plants growing from bulbs. Right now we have this plant blooming. This is called hymenocallus, which means beautiful membrane. Hymenocallus or spider lily. Beautiful membrane refers to these membranes surrounding the flower, which reminded people of spider's legs. So that's why it's called a spider lily. Hymenocallus or spider lily. Here in front, we have something called eucomus. These are eucomus or pineapple lilies. In a couple of weeks, you're gonna see a blossom appearing and the very tiny blossom looks almost like the little tiny pineapple. So these are called pineapple lilies. Hymenocallus, spider lily, pineapple lilies. And over here, a plant we've never had before. It's a brand new plant. This is a dragon lily. We have two forms of lily. We have a dragon lily here. And over to the left, we have another one right here. These are dragon lilies. So this is a brand new plant that has never been at Johanna Shores before. Okay, we're gonna jump to another section of the garden here and I'll point out other lilies. So this flower here is a canna lily. People sometimes call it the state fair flower because here in Minnesota, you see it on the state fair grounds quite a bit. It will get a large red or orange spike in a couple of weeks here. I mentioned calla lilies earlier, beautiful lily, the most beautiful lily in the world, the story of Hera and Heracles. This is a calla lily, a pink one. So we have calla lilies and canna lilies. And walking this way, we have our lily garden uh, about a week ago, this was just full of blossoms. It's now kind of doing a transition. Here we have three types of lilies. We have Asiatic lilies, which are done blooming. Then we have Oriental lilies. Oriental lilies tend to have a little bit larger bloom and they're also much more fragrant. So Oriental lilies, Asiatic lilies. And then at the back, we have both yellow and white tiger lilies. Yellow tiger lilies and orange tiger lilies, sorry. Yellow and orange tiger lilies. So these, this is our lily. Garden. So uh, a lot of people here on campus aren't able to walk around the entire campus, so they don't see the wide variety of daylilies that we have here on campus. So what we've been doing is we've been taking and bringing all the varieties of daylilies we have on campus and bring them here to this garden so they can see the vast variety of colors we have. Pinks and blacks and whites and purples and so on. So these are all from all around campus, all these daylilies here. In the back here, you can see all of these are gladiolas. I mentioned that I went kind of crazy ordering glads this fall. So all of that's in between here and in between in front. Those are all gladiolas. They'll be blooming in the next couple of weeks. Next here, we have our amaryllis garden. If you would have gone into the conservatory around Christmas time, you would have seen uh, we have several amaryllis blooming. The most common one, and the one most people are familiar with, is the red amaryllis. But as you can see here, we've got some other variations. This one is called Picote, and one over there, the white one, is called Merry Christmas. The one to my left, that one's called Merry Christmas. This one, though, is Red Lion, a red amaryllis. So amaryllis gets its origins from Greek mythology. 
Amaryllis was a young Greek maiden who was desperately in love with a young man who had not the slightest interest in her. No matter what she did, he paid no attention to her whatsoever. While well, getting desperate, one day Amaryllis went to visit the man she was in love with. She knocked on the door, and when he opened the door, she took out a golden arrow and stabbed herself in the heart. Blood fell out on the ground it landed, and when the blood landed, this blood-red Amaryllis appeared. Well, the boy felt terrible, and he was so impressed by her devotion to him that he begged and pleaded with the gods to bring her back to life. The gods intervened, and they brought Amaryllis back to life. So the moral of the story is, ladies, if you're interested in someone, all you need to do is go to their house, knock on the door, and when they open the door, take a golden arrow and stab yourself in the heart. And maybe the gods will intervene. Not a best moral. <laughs> We're going to walk over here. One of the other flowers that we have that is a uh, fall blooming nectar flower are sedum. These are autumn joy sedums. Uh, there are a bunch of these down by the pond, and when we weed among them in the fall, we will literally have hundreds and hundreds of wasps and bumblebees and so on swamping around, swarming around us as we uh, go with these flowers. So these are sedums, autumn joy sedums. I'm going to continue walking over here to this garden. This is my bargain basement garden. I do a lot of shopping online, and this section of daylilies over here to my right and the section of daylilies over here to my left are all bargain basement daylilies. You get 100 daylilies for $100. You don't know what color, you don't know what variety, you don't know what height. You just get any type of daylily you want, but you can see they're beautiful daylilies. So a buck a flower is a pretty good deal in my, in my opinion. Continuing on over here, we have a hardy hibiscus. This is the hardy hibiscus. It's just starting to get buds. So in a couple of weeks, you're going to get a large red flower. It's about the size of a dinner plate, the hardy red hibiscus. And we're standing among plants called elephant ears. These are elephant ears. Uh, it gets its name because the leaf of the flower looks kind of like the leaf of an elephant. They're a tropical plant, and once the temperatures start getting really warm, they'll get huge. They'll get enormous elephant ears. Okay, that finishes this section. I got a couple more sections to take you to. Okay, we're here in another section of the garden. A couple of things I want to point out here. Andy is standing next to a hollyhock. A hollyhock was a symbol of fertility in medieval times. You can see there's a lot of buds on the stem, all the buds all the way down, lots of buds. So if a medieval housewife wanted to become pregnant, she would plant hollyhocks by her front door, and then all the neighbors would see hollyhocks by her front door and say, we know what she's going on in there. We know what's going on in there. And to Andy's left is a tree lily. Andy is six foot four inches tall. So you can see how tall these tree lilies are. They can grow up to seven feet tall. Throughout the garden here, you'll see many, many types of tree lilies up against the back. This whole section has a lot of pollinators. So you see daisies, you'll see coneflowers, you'll see phlox. Uh, so all of these are pollinators. Back in the back there, you can see zinnias. All of those are things that are for fall pollinators for butterflies as they make their migration. Over here on this tree, you can see we have a little butterfly feeder, and then there's a little perch next to it. That supposedly is the size that a hummingbird wants to perch on, right next to the butterfly, uh, right next to the hummingbird feeder. Okay, we have one more little section I'm going to show on, and then we're going to move down to the chapel. So one of the projects we've been working on the past couple of years is trying to make the chapel area here a little more uh, enjoyable for visitors. The area around here a couple of years ago was all dead grasses and dead roses or dying roses that were infiltrated with, glass, with grasses. The same thing, this triangle area over here was all dead roses and dead grasses. So a couple of years ago, we pulled everything out and we've started transplanting flowers here, dividing flowers from elsewhere on campus, and also incorporating annuals as the border. So the most recent project we just did is this area over here. This was all dead and dying grasses just last week. Last week we dug out all the grasses and we've been going around campus finding extra daylilies, dividing up daylilies, and planting them in this area. And we'll continue to do some more today. In fact, we have, after this taping is done, we have some more flowers to put in here. One of the other projects we did here is across the way, over here, this hillside. The hillside over here used to have bushes and tall grasses, and the residents were bothered because it blocked the view of the of the lake, of Johanna Shores of the Lake Johanna. So we dug out all the tall grasses, we dug out all the shrubs, and we replaced them with dozens of different types of daylilies. So that now, when people look out, they have a clear vision of Johanna Lake out here. 
Last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask my crew to come over here. Uh, we did get William come and join us. William, wave to the camera. William is our other crew member. So a lot of times you'll see us out working in the garden and you are never bothering us. You are never bothering us if you ask us questions, if you wanna to talk to us, if you wanna ask questions about the flowers. We consider it part of our job and our mission to, to uh, talk to the residents, to talk to the staff, to help you learn about flowers and so on. So you are never, ever, ever, ever bothering us. Please come and talk to us. Please come and visit the gardens. And now like at the end of Beverly Hillbillies, I'm gonna have everybody wave goodbye to the camera. Y'all come back now, you hear? Bye. <laughs>